been on radio for many, many years, and I get calls from people, pastors all over the place, and they call me and they say, man, I love your radio show. Your, mo- your wife was the best teacher ever at Piedmont that I had. My whole life changed when I had her speech class. And I just let them go and go, and I finally have to clarify, and I'm going to clarify to y'all, Nancy is my mom, not my wife, okay? Now, I know some places in the South, you know, it's a little bit, you know, like they say some places that if you divorce your wife, she's still your sister, okay, things like that. But not in the case of the Epperson. She's mom, and I love her, and I know y'all love Mrs. Epperson, and she is not here today, which maybe is good because she's a speech professor, so, and I'm speaking, so she can, but she's so gracious, she's praying, and she, gives, she wanted me to give you all her love. Hey, I want to ask you, I want to throw out a word. I'm going to do a Google with you right now. I'm going to just throw a Google, and then we're going to hear an amazing song by Mark that's on the song number five of the album. And I'm going to do a quick Google, the word redemption. What comes to mind, and it's okay if it's not spiritual. The word redemption. So I Googled this word, and guess what came up? How about them Tar Heels? Come on, you can let me hear it. Okay, okay. Look, hey, now, so it's all over. So you know they, they, they you know they, they're, they get all the way last year, lose, and then they come back, and so that's the theme. So on the cover of Sports Illustrated and the cover of all these magazines, secular newspapers, TV, everywhere, you have the word redemption. It's huge. It's big. It's and it's all about those Tar Heels. And I got to thinking, redemption, huge viewership, by the way, 21% over last year's viewership. Millions of people watched that game. The largest number of live streams ever at a national championship, over 4.4 million live streams like on mobile and outside of the game. Crazy numbers, huge numbers. Everyone's watching the game. And the theme of that whole game before, during, and after is redemption. And I thought, wow, I think we just heard about redemption. Just now. And I thought about what Jesus Christ did. So today we're going to go 2,000 years back to another very public event, which was dark and ugly and bloody. And we're going to see what happened there. And what's cool about what happened there is they're already calling Carolina, they're already calling them the Redeem Team which we thought the guys in 08 that won the gold were, but they're calling them the Redeem Team now. And if you are a believer in this room right now, I want you to say as loud as you can, I am redeemed. On three, one, two, three. I am redeemed. If you are a believer, I want you to say as loud as you can those words, I am redeemed. So this is going to go on Instagram. Okay, I'm on the gram. I got 12 likes once on a post. I'm I'm not trying to brag. Pride goes before fall. But... Um, I got to put this up, okay? So I'm going to give you the cue. When I say, we got a message for you, and we're going to say, we're on God's redeem team. So we're going to say, I am redeemed, and then we're going to say, we're on God's redeem team. How's that sound? Okay? Hold on. Hold on, y'all. Come on, this technology. So we all know that the Redeemed Team and Redemption is all about the national championship, and we're glad that title came to North Carolina. But I'm with a bunch of people that are celebrating a bigger redemption. Because when we hear the word redemption, we think about what happened at Calvary on that cross 2,000 years ago. And we all want to say, I am redeemed. So on three, everybody, what do you say? One, two, three. I am redeemed. Awesome. And we're on whose redeemed team? One, two, three. We're on God's redeemed team. Awesome. I'm at Piedmont International University. You guys are great. Let's hear it. Come on, make some noise. You know, I tell you what. Look, an alcohol-free celebration of the greatest championship ever. What Jesus Christ bought. We got to get excited in here. Come on. How about that? All right. Amen. Awesome. So that's going to go on the gram. That's going to get views. That's probably going to get 25 views. I'm not, again, I'm not trying to brag, okay? The, The numbers speak for themselves. So what would happen if you were there? My text today is Matthew chapter 27, 36. Please turn there. Matthew 27, verse 36, a very simple text that just 
captivated me as I'm writing this book. It's in this book, Matthew 27, 36, which simply says this. And I'm going to, we're going to go through this, and then I got, so you got to be blessed by what you're going to hear. Matthew 27, 36. Sitting down, they kept watch over him there. So today we're going to see through the eyes of those who sat there at this event. We're going to talk about who they are, what they saw, and then what they heard. And so there's a song that really takes you there that I don't think we sing enough. I'm going to ask my brother Mark if he'd come up and unbelievable things happened. I think it was last year or the year before, Mark, and you can share that real quick if you like, you know, over, over in Asia, powerful with this song. And he's going to sing, and while he's singing, um, I'm going to get someone to help me pass out some things that I want you to hold on to for a second. Just take your time. Hold on to as long as you want for you to think about, were you there? What, was it, what would it have been like to be at that cross, at that event that changed history, that really brought true everlasting redemption. So I'm going to pass those out, but you guys take it away, please.
watched him there. So who are they? They are obviously the Roman soldiers. These are well-oiled executioner machines. These guys knew exactly how to extract the maximum amount of pain out of a criminal without letting them die, protracting that process out. They were the religious leaders. They were innocent bystanders, thousands of people on pilgrimage for Passover, walking through with their kids, with their sacrifice to the temple, and they walk by this cross with this mangled man up there. What's going on? They are the one beloved disciple, John, who's still there, and his mom and some women who were there. And sitting down, they watched him there. So they were a whole lot of people, but I got some people in here that are going to share. Stand up real quick, number one, and read this verse, Matthew 27, 67. What were they a part of? Read it real loud now. Everybody got to have your best radio voice here, okay? Read it real loud. 27, 67. 26, 67. Okay. They spit in his face, they struck him, and they slapped him. What did they do in, in verse 68 of Matthew 26? Who's got that? Right here. Read it real loud. Matthew 27, 26, what did they do there? Number three. So they scourged Jesus and delivered him to be crucified. Scourging was one of the most brutal, brutal forms of torture ever invented. The soldiers would, weave, would braid leather thongs into a whip and then weave metal balls and sharp bone fragments into it as a result of this whipping, Lee Strobel in his book, Case for Christ, says the back would be so shredded that part of the spine was sometimes exposed by the deep, deep cuts. The whipping would have gone on all the way from the shoulders all the way down the back, the buttocks, and the backs of the legs. It was just horrible. Isaiah 52, 14 says Christ's visage was unrecognizable. He was up on a post and being brutally whipped as hard as these guys could swing with these these long whips with sharp shards of this, these things, these items in the back of it, ripping out his flesh. What's the next one? Uh, Matthew 27, 28. Who's got that? Read it real loud, sir. Good. Okay. Those wounds are open, and then they put this robe on to mock him. What's the next one? Uh, who's got Matthew 27, 29? Okay. Okay, R.C. Sproul in his commentary on John said these thorns were 12 inches long and pressed into a very sensitive area of the head, pressed down right into these nerve endings around the head, all to the sport of the soldiers. And then what happened in verse, um, verse 30 of Matthew chapter 27? Did someone read that? Right here. Um, and they spit on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. Okay. More spitting, more striking. Matthew 27, 35, who has that? Who's got the last one right here? Real loud. So they crucified him, which is the absolute worst form of execution some say ever invented. And so their Christ is on the cross. And then the question is, that's what they saw, and that's what they participated in. Then the question is, what did they hear? Because after all the torture, and after all the abuse, and after all the flogging and the scourging, and you have the nails, where are those nails? Are they going around? Those nails as part of the persecution, uh, Psalm 22 says, they pierced my hands and feet, a, a prophetic uh, of this thing, before, actually, before crucifixion was even invented. Who has those nails? Where are they? They're being passed around. Pass those nails around. Everybody, I want you to feel the steel. The steel is real. Imagine that nail going right through the, this minion nerve right here in the arm, through the feet. Unbelievable pain. Nailed like an animal to a tree. Why? What did he do wrong? And then... The first words out of his mouth. Who's got that? Luke 23, 34. Who's got that? Read it real loud. The first thing. What did they hear? We saw what they saw. What did they hear? So silent through the trial, silent through all of these accusations, silent through the beating. He could have called a legion of angels. Utter silence until hanging on the tree of death, the words of life come out. Seven words of life he cried. Seven words in his last breath. Seven words as Jesus died. Seven words of life 
from the tree of death. And the first words was a word of prayer, a word of forgiveness. As blood flowed from his wounds, forgiveness flows from his words. Father, not destroy them, not avenge me and kill them. Father, forgive them. So you have they, 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 they. We just read they, they, they. And Jesus says the very next they or them to be written in, in Scripture, in Holy Bible, is from the mouth of Jesus. When he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. They had no idea. Do we have any idea what our sin did to the Savior? Do we have any idea that I deserve to be on that cross? That I deserve that pain? Do we have an idea that it was me swinging that hammer, nailing? Imagine, picture yourself nailing that nail through the Son of God's hand. Swinging that whip. So, Father, forgive them. And then what do you say? Who's got, who's got Luke 23, 43? This is the next words out of his mouth. Forgiveness happened right there. Who's got that? Read it real loud. This guy deserves to be on a cross. He did nothing. He did everything wrong, the thief. These are modern-day terrorists like Taliban. The only person directly given forgiveness and pardon at that place of Golgotha on that dark day was the worst guy up there. Not the religious leaders, not any of the fancy people, not any of the, the wealthy people or the soldiers or the leading military guys. It was this nasty, low-down thief. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a, a wretch like me, the thief. Jesus gave that man salvation. He said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise. Not you'll be like me, not go get consecrated, get, uh, get baptized, catechized, go to new members class, and let's get you on a missions trip, and let, please take a bath, dude, because you stink. No, it's today you'll be with me. Because that's what, that's what eternal life is, John 73. It's knowing Christ. It's it's being with him in intimacy and fellowship with him. And then the third thing, what is the third thing they heard? Real quick, we're running out of time here. Third thing they heard. Who's got this verse in St. John? 19, 26, and 27. Who's got that? Right here, read it real loud. Even in his dying moment, caring for his mom and for his disciple. As his physical body is being destroyed and torn, his spiritual body is being formed because those two have become active in what's called the church, the body of Christ, right there at the cross. Powerful words. What else did they hear? They heard a word of pain. Matthew 27, 46. Who's got that real quick? Pop up and read it real quick, real loud. More painful than a million crucifixions, more painful than any physical description of pain is the separation Christ felt in that moment. Pitch black for three hours in the middle of the day as the high priest goes behind the veil, as the wrath of God is poured out on the spotless Lamb of God who is purchasing our salvation, who is bearing in his body our sins on the tree, who is despised and rejected, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, who is feeling your pain, the only one can look at you and say, I feel your pain. They heard another word. John, 1928. Quick, who's got that? Stand up and read it. Okay. And in the King James, it's just, I thirst. The briefest word translated in English is the only thing Jesus said about all that physical discomfort. I thirst. The, the water of life crying. I thirst, so that we could drink of the living water and be satisfied forever. What do you say in John 19, 30? The greatest closing statement of all time. Read it real loud. Wow. It is finished. To tell us, die. The greatest closing statement of all time. Done. Paid for. It is finished. He accomplished what no team could accomplish. He accomplished what no heavyweight champion could. He accomplished the greatest feat, the greatest victory of all time on that cross. And he cried triumphantly. This was a victory shout. It is finished. And the final thing he said, the final thing they heard 
is in Luke 23, 46. And what I call a word of peace, and all of these are very detailed in this book, and I really hope you'll take your time through them. And we gotta, we got to wrap up. And you know, you're going to love this last song, and I'm going to bring them up. But I just want you to, to, to hear this. Luke 23, who has this last verse? Who did I give this to? Right here in the back. Read it real loud for everyone to hear. The ultimate RIP. He willingly, John 10 says, laid his life down. It wasn't taken from him. He willingly died. And this is the, the final words from the cross. So what do we do with all this? We saw what they saw. We heard what they heard. What do we do? How do we respond? Hebrews 12, 2. Fixing our eyes on Jesus. Look to him. It's a person that saves us. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's what he did for us. We focus so much on what we're doing for him. As a Christian college student, I struggle with that. Am I doing enough? Man, am I in the word enough? Am I doing this enough? And yes, we need to be in the word. And yes, we need to be growing and sharing Christ. But we need to rest in the reality of our identity and who he is and what he did. In the Philippians 1, 6 identity, he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it, to it has finished it in you. So resting and knowing him, the reality of redemption and who he is. And as the worship team comes up to sing this last song, and we're going to get you all out of here, I want to just challenge you in this area. I just love that word to the thief. Today you'll be with me. Philippians 3.10, that I may know Christ. Knowing Jesus, do you really know him? You're going to be around a lot of people this time of year that know about him. If you're an American, you know about him and God and Jesus. Of course, you're a Christian. You may not know what that means, but, but do you know him as your personal Savior? Have you truly been redeemed? Now listen, listen. There was a private very private group text. You've been a part of group text before. In 2016, the Villanova player, in the last second of the game, dropped a three and won the national championship. The Carolina team went back to Chapel Hill, <clears throat> completely devastated, in tears, torn up, struggling. Justin Jackson, the team captain, said, we're going to have to do, we're going to get our private team text going, just the teammates, and I've got to text them one word. I've got to text them one word that absolutely embodies what happened and what's going to happen and where we're going from here. And what word did he text them? What? I can't hear you. Redemption. Everyone say it loud. Redemption. What's the one word that pulsates from page to page of the Holy Bible from Genesis to Revelation? What's that word? Redemption. Because on that hill on Calvary, his mercy came down. His love bled out. And guess what happened? Eternity was changed forever. Unlike a professional team or a college team that wins and then a few years later they struggle and the coach gets fired. And it's elusive and you're trying and trying and trying to earn and earn and earn. Jesus Christ said, it is finished. And he redeemed us and he bought us back from sin and from hell and from death. And the thief got it. He was only moments away from eternity, but he was only inches away from Jesus. And he said, Lord, he was stuck on a cross just like Jesus. But his heart, though his body was high up, his heart was bowed low. He said, Lord, remember me, and maybe today you need to get on your knees and go to that cross and trust him. Because what happens is you become part of God's redeemed team. You become part of a team that has already won that will reign, because he shall reign forever and ever. Who is this king of glory? Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be lifted up, ye everlasting doors, and the king of glory will come in. Who is the king of glory? The Lord, God Almighty. He is the king of glory, and he shall reign, and he's coming back, and every knee will bow, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Say that with me. Jesus Christ is Lord. Say it loud like you mean it. Jesus Christ is Lord. Get excited. Hallelujah. We have a Savior, guys. We've won. We're not going to get drunk and celebrate for one night and then get back to class. We have won. This is who we are. We're in the body. We're on the redeemed team. 
forever and ever with Jesus to reign with him. And he's coming back. The king is coming back. Not with a bloody crown of thorns. Not in a humble little manger as a baby in a, in a manure infested cattle trough. No, he's coming back with eyes of fire. He's coming back to judge. He's coming back to take his own. To take those who know him forever. So who are we telling about this amazing love? How can it be that thou, my God, didst die for me?